Hi, I'm Chris Roselli. And I'm Rawa Haila Mariam. Welcome to Western Window, the show made for you by students at Western Washington University. In today's Western Window, we'll chat with noted Western alumna Joyce Taylor here in the studio. We'll find out more about Western's Idea Institute and we'll hear what it's like to navigate life as a diverse student here at Western. We'll watch as a sculpture on campus gets new life and we'll mix it up to discover the real faces of STEM. So stay with us as we explore our world through Western Window. Western alumna Joyce Taylor is best known for her work as an Emmy award-winning journalist and as the anchor of King 5 Morning News in Seattle. During her 25-year career, Taylor has covered the stories of heroes, presidents, policymakers, entertainers, athletes, activists, and hundreds of people who make up our communities and affect our daily lives. She was recognized as one of Western's 100 Outstanding Alumni of the Century, and we were lucky enough to interview her right here in the studio. Today in the studio, we're pleased to have Joyce Taylor, veteran morning news anchor of Seattle's King 5 Morning News, two-time Emmy winner for her journalistic work and a Western Washington University alumna. Welcome to Western Window, Joyce. Thanks for having me. Can you tell me a little bit about where you grew up and how you ended up here at Western? Oh, I'd love to. So I grew up in Tacoma, uh, one of five kids in a pretty big family, uh, middle class, went to a huge high school, and actually Western wasn't my first choice. I had never been to campus and my twin sister um, chose this campus first and I wanted to go to a big university, yeah. so I thought. <laughs> so I actually um, applied to the University of Washington and I got, I got in there and my sister got in here and then we decided we wanted to go to the same university. Mm -hmm. So I came here with her and it was the best decision I ever made. Oh, that's nice Because I, I was so happy here and they had the best broadcasting program, unbeknownst to me at the time. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it just turned out to be fate, I think. What was your experience like here at Western? I had a great college experience here. In fact, when I was driving uh, into Bellingham, into Whatcom County and then into Bellingham, I always have such a great feeling when I get closer and closer to campus because I had such great memories of um, the friends I made here, the uh, education that I got here, and um, just the overall experience that I had g growing up here. I, I always think of myself as having come of age here. Yeah. Um, moving from high school into adulthood yeah. and really um, knowing what I wanted to do with my career and really the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. Falling in love with my profession, making um, my best friends I made in college. Yeah. And so I, I had just a, a wonderful, wonderful experience here. What was campus like back then? The college campus is so much more diverse now. Yeah. Even in your uh -huh. class, I'm looking at this yeah. rainbow of students, which is so different from when I was here. There were a few students of color on campus, mm -hmm. a few African-American students, a few Asian students, but there, we were far and few between. Mm -hmm. And now I look at campus and I think, oh my gosh, you're so lucky to yeah. have so many different types of students on campus from these different walks of life, so your experience is so much richer, mm -hmm. I think, um, in terms of the student makeup than mine was. When did you start thinking about journalism and like reporting? Mm -hmm. How did you get into your career? I knew very early about ninth grade, that I wanted to go into um, broadcasting. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily be on television, but storytelling. So what would you say is your favorite part about being a news anchor, since you didn't oh, plan that's on? That's easy, that's <laughs> super easy. I have met the most extraordinary people in, throughout my career. Mm -hmm. And they're not the people that you might expect. Mm -hmm. I have met some famous people, Michael Jordan, and presidents and people like that, but the most interesting people I have met are um, ordinary people who have done just amazing things with their lives or they've uh, impacted other people's lives in extraordinary ways. What would you say is the hardest part about your job? I have a phrase that is my phrase for the year in a word. My phrase is less is more. Mm -hmm. 
because you know, I'm, I'm, my phrase is, is less is more because I want less stress, less drama, um, more joy. Mm -hmm. And my word is courage okay. because I think that especially in today's climate, um, journalists need to really have the courage to get to the truth mm -hmm. of stories and not be concerned at all about being liked mm -hmm. or um, what others um, are, how others view their work. They just need to be concerned about peeling back a story yeah. and getting to the truth of what is happening in the world that we're living in now. For people who are like our generation who are pursuing journalism careers, mm -hmm. what would you say to others? I would be doing writing and storytelling on social media. Okay. Television is going is on the web. Yeah. So we stream our broadcasts mm -hmm. on um, king5.com. Yeah. We cannot just get away anymore with putting a television show on at 5 a.m. and asking you to watch at 5 a.m. Our information is on television, mm -hmm. it's on our mobile device, it's on Twitter, it's on Facebook, it's on YouTube. We are information streams on, it's on multi -plat multiple platforms. Mm -hmm. And so I think students today need to think about where do you want your information. It needs to be across all platforms. Mm -hmm. And so when you produce content, mm -hmm. you need to be a content provider. Okay not just a storyteller, a writer for print, or a writer for, for television, but a content provider for multiple platforms. So if I were your age now, I would be blogging, I would be writing, I would have my own websites, mm -hmm. I would be doing writing and storytelling on social media. What do you think is next for you like in the future? What more do you want to achieve? Raising kids to be thoughtful and compassionate and um, giving in the world, giving back to the world, being uh, that's sort of where my, where my focus is. Okay. The older you get, you will realize that you have to, ju I just live in the moment. Okay. You know, you, tomorrow's not guaranteed. <laughs> yeah, and so I used to live like that. Okay. Five years out, four years out, 10 years out, what I want to be doing. But now I really can appreciate um, like today, like I'm so excited to be here today and have this experience. So I really try to be present. Yeah. It's really great to see so many of you all um, entering this profession. You know, I've, I've covered Super Bowls. I recently covered the inaugural. Mm -hmm. I've seen things and I've met people and I've had experiences I would never ever have had but for being in this field. Yeah. And uh, it has impacted my life in ways that I had never have imagined, would never have imagined. And it's because I got an, an extraordinary education here yeah. at Western that I really think is unmatched. Joyce Taylor, noted journalist and Western alum. Thank you. Thank you. At the Idea Institute, entrepreneurship is for everyone. Whether you focus on social justice, environment, arts, education, business, humanities, engineering, or any other subject, this interdisciplinary program is designed to provide the knowledge, skills, and abilities to successfully engage in entrepreneurship and innovative behaviors in new and existing organizations. This whole program expanded my idea of what an education could be. You'll join a team to come up with ideas and then you'll find out that you're all from different backgrounds and that's why your idea is so good. Making a change in the world and being a successful business person should go hand in hand. It made me realize that I can do a lot more than I thought I was able to before. Imagine what happens when you, when you take a an electrical engineering student and crash him into a Fairhaven student who's studying social justice issues with a business student who is, is studying how to get your message out through marketing. Put those people all together, you know, the magic happens. I, I really like our learning objectives. They all come down to what kind of people are driving our society and they're the kind of people who listen and ask questions first, the kind who seek to understand, the, the ones who are rooted deeply in who they are. Um, I'm, I'm proud to build a program like that. And I think that being in this program has altered my perception of entrepreneurship, being more socially minded as well as more, especially with this program, more inclusive. 
In fact, there isn't even a particular major that you need. We've got a minor for it that you can add on. And that's brought so much richness to the program to have so many different people of different backgrounds. What we say is, you bring your passion, we'll show you the process how to make change happen. And what entrepreneurship really showed me is the business of making a difference and, and how much more important that kind of capital can be than any amount of money. It's really important for us to create a corridor to the community and that runs both ways. It wasn't just sitting in a classroom and taking notes and taking tests, but you know, we were out interviewing people. We were talking to local community members and researching how our idea could make the community better, like how we could actually implement it, and then actually implement it. The community is much richer and deeper than I ever expected it to be. Our expectation is that they um, kind of crack open who they are and then learn to take that and connect it with others who are doing the same thing. Like to be gentle with themselves and with others and then to be fierce about exploring and being passionate and moving forward. What's important is the development of this you know, fantastic person in front of you. As I actually progressed through this minor, I realized that change is actually growth. You can come in from any facet of Western and get exactly the education that is suited to you. Noted sculptor Mia Westerland Rosen created Flank 2 in 1978. Using copper and concrete, the piece balances geometric form with the paint-like texture of the sculpture surface and challenges viewers to stretch their perception about energy and perfection. After almost 30 years on campus, the work had begun to show the effects of time, and Miss Westerland Rosen came back to Western to return her amazing work to its former glory. My name is Mia Westerland Rosen. I'm a sculptor from New York City. That's why I'm here, because the piece was made of cement with steel rod in it, which was the way you did that then. And in 35 years, the steel and the concrete work against each other and it corroded and has fallen apart. So I'm here to rebuild the piece. Uh, Mia Westerland Rosen's piece comes in, uh, in very unusual way. She had an exhibition at the Vancouver Art Gallery, major one-person exhibition, and her gallerist, the, the famous New York gallerist Leo Castelli, approached the university and offered them to uh, offered the university to uh, show one of her pieces that that was in, in her exhibition here on a long-term basis. So it was originated as, as a loan uh, uh, and uh, came down here, was installed, and eventually she donated her work to the gallery. So uh, I contacted her and she said, well, how about I just remake the work? So what I did was I did change the, the technique. Instead of uh, making it solid cement with rebar in it, which is an old-fashioned method, um, we've done it with what's called glass-reinforced cement, which is called GFRC. And you, um, you make the mixture with um, half Portland, half sand, a polymer additive, and fiberglass strand. I started using resin and I used it for about five years, and I made fairly um, simple shapes, uh, but they, had a, they were a bit organic, although reductive. That's what post-minimalism was. Nobody wanted to totally run off and make figuration or anything. They wanted to keep abstract 
and they wanted to keep reductive. The reason I did resin and cement were, was cost. They were both very cheap. Well, I had met a, a bunch of artists in New York um, through friends from school. They, you know, they were very encouraging and I started making work. Uh, as I say, when I was about 27 or 8, I started making work to show. And I think there were only three women artists in a big group of, of male artists. And I know that uh, it was me uh, and uh, Lee Bontecu and, and Marisol. And uh, I, I asked Mia a little bit about it when she was here, and she told me that uh, it was a very difficult atmosphere, uh, very sexist and misogynist and, and um, it was very hard for the art, uh, women artists uh, Marisol and Le Pontecu uh, kind of left me I was the only one who, who just stuck with it must have been incredible pressure people in those days thought that male artists were better it's not so much that anymore Written by journalism professor Maria McLeod and directed by Western alum Carrie Wardrop, First Person Diverse Student Stories is a collection of seven monologues about college student lives told from diverse perspectives. Telling the true stories of current Western students of color, differing abilities, ages, ethnicities, and gender identities, this compelling new play gives us unique insight into the people around us. My name is Carrie Wardrop and I'm directing this play, First Person, Diverse Student Stories. Diversity means that we come from very different places with very different experiences that no one person's experience is like somebody else. Maria interviewed people, um, in a wide range of diversity, racial diversity, ethnic diversity, religious, gender identity, ability, and so forth. The pieces became monologues, not interviews. They were changed enough so that there was a theatricality element infused in them. I think I scared out of my mom, though. I didn't do a good job of laying the groundwork before I came out to her. When she heard the word transition, as in someday, I don't know for sure, I may consider transitioning, her mind just immediately went to hate crimes and botched surgeries. Just because I don't look like the poster Muslim you see in the media doesn't mean that every single Muslim woman in the world wears a burqa and only shows her eyes. And these particular stories were intriguing and powerful in that they were stories of people who are among and around us every day right here at Western that we might not get to know otherwise. And uh, being able to hear their um, stories amplified in this way so that more people could have some inkling into an experience that is different than their own was really appealing to me. My family is in Lummi. My mother is full-blooded Navajo, and my father is three-fourths Filipino and one-quarter Nooksack. My father likes to call us Indipinos because we're a little unique on the res. We're native, but mixed race. I was the bad, good kid in school, and I'd hang out with the bad, cool kids. At the same time, I was really into student government and leadership, which was bad because I'd be made fun of. But I'd also be loved, but I'd also be hated. 
It was around this time I really started getting into YouTube. I had my own YouTube channel and I'd record myself singing and upload it. I had followers too and I wasn't famous, but people knew who I was and it caused some drama. This is an entirely Western production and it's an amazing production. From my interviewees who were all Western students to the actors who are five Western students and two Western alums, to the director who's a graduate from Western's theater and dance program, to the people doing the lighting, to, I mean, this is has so many layers to it. What I want people to walk away with is realizing that you don't know what you think you know about people. I want people to leave this performance with a new sense of um, who these students are. The way our world is right now, uh, I feel like it is even more important for each of us to go out of our way to listen to each other, to go out of our way to find out what truths are under the skins of the people around us because we are all uh, so interconnected and we're all going to really need to depend on each other to move forward. Mix It Up, Faces of STEM is a yearly event that aims to bring students throughout the scientific disciplines together. Showing diversity in the science fields, Mix It Up fosters inclusion in STEM on multiple levels and makes it clear that scientists look like all of us. So the, the main point of Mix It Up was to basically have this large kind of mixer, this kind of communal social event where students knew that this environment wants them to be there. So when you start the year that you know that you have this kind of support system and you know that there are these clubs that are here that you could actually utilize. At this event, one of the things that we have is a career panel, and they try to get faculty members at Western um, that maybe have had a little bit different than the traditional experiences in science to talk about what it was like for them, you know, throughout high school, throughout their undergraduate career, um, and then going into grad school about some of the hurdles they faced to try and support each other and really encourage people that maybe don't feel like they're meant to be in the sciences. I did have a lot of preconceived notions about what a computer scientist looked like. You know, I saw the traditional Bill Gates pocket protector, some guy living in a basement, you know, kind of those stereotypes I feel like were really enforced and reinforced throughout my life. And then when I came into the field, I realized that there were very few female role models for me in computer science. Some of us became physics or chemistry majors in spite of yeah. the stereotypes. Yeah. Um, in fact, there were, in our modern physics class, which is one of the harder second year physics classes, there were seven of us women in the class, and it was the largest population of women that had ever been in that class. Trend is not destiny. Yeah. Even though there have never been seven women in this class before, we're all gonna make it through. And we really had this very cohesive network of people, and we did homework together, and we studied for tests together. We all sat in the same row. <laughs> um, and it definitely, that camaraderie and that I can do it because you can do it really helped us get through. I'm also the STEM inclusion and outreach specialist here at Western. And I realized when I was growing up, I honestly thought that mixed people like me, people that were um, multiracial, we just didn't exist, <laughs> you know, 20 years ago because I didn't see anyone in, in the movies. I think everyone needs to understand that racism, sexism, homophobia, all that stuff is kind of ingrained in our society. So truly it is um, mostly because of how our systems are made and our systems were made by the dominant culture. So therefore it just kind of snowballs and just always is about the dominant culture. And, and it's really hard to get um, people who are not part of that dominant culture to feel like they belong because they didn't really make it to begin with uh, here in academia. I really feel like there's a, there's a stigma to science. I feel like um, a lot of scientists are looked at as intimidating and scary and science itself, physics is very scary. Every time I say I'm a physicist, people stop talking to me. I want to have that go away. And, and there's many reasons on why that exists. Why is science so intimidating? And um, it's, it's the culture that scientists create 
It's the culture non-scientists create about science and the stereotypes that exist, that environment of exclusion that maybe some people don't even know they're contributing to or part of or being affected by. So I created this position so that I can help all of these different facets of, of um, how science is being seen and once you're actually in science, how, how do you deal with that? I want people to feel like they belong in their STEM major early on. We all struggle. You know, I think if you talk to any faculty member on this campus, there have been classes and challenges along the way. There are things that are hard. Mm -hmm. um, and there are definitely times when I thought, oh, why am I doing this? Don't feel like you have to go it alone. Don't feel like, oh, this is hard for me. I must not be good enough to do that. Everybody feels that way. Everybody thinks some parts of it are hard. And that's part of the challenge and the excitement of it. Yeah, I think that's really important as far as trying to find your community of, of people that you can kind of rely upon. Because if it wasn't for, frankly, mentors that I had had, I wouldn't be where I am today. I was the, I was the first one in my family to go, to go to college. And so as a result, it was, it was all kind of new. I didn't have anybody in the fam immediate family that what to expect. Don't let anyone tell you what's right for you. I think that there's a lot of pressure to be the same way that everyone else is, especially if you're a minority. There's like a propensity to try to be like what you see in other people. And I think that, that the, those differences are what make us special and unique and those voices are ex the exact voices we need at the table. Stay strong to your own, what you want for your own life, and don't let someone else make those decisions for you. Decide for yourself what you want and just go for it. That's it for this episode. We'll see you next time as we explore our world at and around Western Washington University. Western Window is proud to partner with the following student publications. Clipson Magazine is published twice each quarter and includes features, multimedia, and issues that affect lives across the greater Bellingham area. You can find it online at clipsonmagazine.com. The Western Front is the official newspaper of Western Washington University, published by the Student Publications Council and funded by your advertising dollars. The Western Front. Get it first, get it right, at westernfrontonline.net. The Planet is Western Washington University's award-winning quarterly environmental publication and the only undergraduate environmental magazine in the United States. Explore the Planet online at planet.wwu.edu.